The living word of God is from Exodus chapter 30, verse 17 to 21. Exodus uh, chapter 30, from 17 to 21. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You should also make a labor of bronze with its base on bronze for washing, and you shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar and you shall put water in it. Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet from it. When they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water so that they will not die. Or when they approach the altar to minister by offering up in smoke of fire, sacrifice to the Lord. So they shall wash their hands and their feet so that they will not die. And it shall be a perpetual statute for them. For Aaron and his descendants and throughout their generations. This is the word of God. Amen.
our Hosanna Choir a round of applause. Thank you. And I'd like to thank our Loimus praise team for leading us in praise at the beginning of worship. And I want to thank all of you. Um, good morning and welcome to our um, October United Worship here at Evergreen Church, where we are all gathered together as one family, where we could truly uh, see that we are one in Christ as we worship together with one faith. And I pray that our Father God will be here among us. May he receive this worship and may he bless each and every one of us with the incredible blessing that he promised to Abraham and his descendants. Amen. Um, before we begin, I'd like to check to see if all the transmitters are working properly. Okay, so good morning once again. Um, today, based upon Exodus chapter 30, verses 17 through 21, I want to share with you a message entitled, A Laver of Bronze for Washing. As you can see, um, we're wearing black gowns now. Uh, this signifies that we are in the season of fall. Starting with the first week of October until Easter, uh, we put on black gowns. And then from Easter until the last week of September, we wear the white gowns. So 2018 is slowly coming to a close. We are well into the season of autumn. So days are flying by really fast, aren't they? Today, the text that we read is about a laver. Uh, what's a laver? A laver is basically a wash basin. They put water in it so that the priests could wash their hands and feet inside the tabernacle. <clears throat> so why is this uh, any important for us? Why is this significant at all? Remember what the tabernacle was. The tabernacle was a mobile sanctuary, and the plans for this tabernacle were given to Moses from God on Mount Sinai sometime in 1446 B.C. And then according to Exodus chapter 40, verse 17, it says that the next year, which is 1445 B.C., on the first day of the first month of that year, the tabernacle was erected. What was the purpose of this tabernacle? According to Exodus chapter 25, verse 8 and verse 22, the Bible tells us that it was a place where God was going to dwell among the Israelites. It was God's house where he would dwell with the people of Israel, and it was a place where God would meet with them. This is a tremendous statement, taking into account the fact that we're all descendants of Adam. What happened to Adam when he fell? Adam and Eve were banished from the Garden of Eden, kicked out from the presence of God because of their sin. But when God told Moses to have the Israelites build the tabernacle, what he was trying to say is, I want you guys to come back to me. I want us to be reconciled. I want to live among you. I want to be your God. I would like to have you as my people. This is truly a statement of mercy and love by our God who came to be reconciled with us, even though we were the ones who were at fault. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2 says, Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. See, the Bible clearly states the reason that there's a separation between God and man is our sin. It's sin that hides God from us. But the fact that God has come back to Israel and said, I want to live with you once again, signifies that God is now going to take care of that sin somehow. And that tabernacle is the very place where this is going to happen. The tabernacle is the place where he could take care of their sins, where he will meet with the Israelites, he will talk with them, have fellowship with them, and he will be their God. 
So in that sense, the tabernacle is a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, the glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. See, Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt there in Greek literally means He tabernacled among us. It means he pitched a tent amongst the people of the world and lived with us. And in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. See, Jesus is the only way for us to come to meet with God our Father. In the Old Testament, it was the tabernacle where you went to meet with God. So Jesus Christ is foreshadowed in the tabernacle. Now, in today's text, before you could enter into the holy place, it says that the priests had to, first of all, pass by the altar of burnt offering. But most importantly, they needed to wash their hands and feet in the laver. And what's interesting is that in verse 20 and verse 21, the statement, so that they will not die, is repeated twice. It says, when they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water so that they will not die. Also in verse 21, so they shall wash their hands and their feet so that they will not die. Washing your hands and feet is this important. If I were taught this when I was young, I would have washed my hands a lot more, right? I know that some of us here don't like to wash. But the Bible says it's this important. So why was it so important that they washed their hands and feet before they went to God? And not only that, does this still apply to us today? Does this matter now? Well, what I can tell you is this. The outward ceremonial activity was only valid when the temple was still around but the temple is no longer here with us. Even the Jews do not worship in the temple anymore. So the outward ceremonial activity is no longer valid. However, the spiritual meaning behind the act is still very valid for us, even for Christians today. And that's why we need to understand why it was so important that they washed their hands and feet. So let us see what the significance of the laver laver, and washing our hands and feet really means. First, at the basic level, it shows us the kind of devotion that God desires in our preparations before coming to worship Him. God desires for us to be devoted in our preparation before worship. So there's the statement, cleanliness is next to godliness, right? I think that's a very truth statement. And in English, we talk about our Sunday best, right? I think some of us may have heard of that term, Sunday best. Because usually in the old days, when you go to church on Sunday, you put on your best clothing, best outfit. You clean it, you wash it, you iron it. You wash yourself, and you want to look the best for our Lord when we come to church. Now, this still does go on nowadays, but many times, many people neglect this part of worship, the preparation that needs to go in before we come to church. Here at our church, I know that, you know, we all dress properly and wash ourselves But in many other churches, I see that some people just come with tattered t-shirts and shorts, maybe flip-flops. They're not really dressed properly. But at the basic level, what God is trying to teach us here is that there needs to be devotion and preparation in worship. It's not just something you do at the spur of the moment. Oh, wait, it's Sunday morning. I guess I should go to church. It's not like that. I hope that all of us here have showered this morning, washed ourselves, put on the best clothing, right? Can we take a sniff at our neighbor and see if they showered? (laughs) Secondly, what does the labor teach us? 
In the Bible, outward cleanliness was usually connected to inner purity. Okay? Outward cleanliness was usually connected to inner purity. For example, in Psalm chapter 24, verses 3 and 4, it says this, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. See here in verse 4 of Psalm 24, see how the psalmist connects clean hands with pure heart, right? Clean hands and pure heart always go together. They're, they go hand in hand. Also in James chapter 4, verse 8, it says this, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Once again, clean hands and pure hearts go together. So you see in the Bible, clean hands are a reflection of our pure heart. But the direction is very important. Where does it start and where does it go into? It doesn't start from your hands and lead to a pure heart. It goes the other way around. So for example, just because you wash your hands regularly or very often is not going to make your heart pure also. However, if your hearts are pure, then as a reflection of that, we will want to have even our outer parts clean when we come to God. So the clean hands reflect the pure heart. But what comes first is the pure heart. Remember when Jesus was crucified, Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea, what did he do? He washed his hands in front of the people, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. That was in Matthew chapter 27, verse 24. It says, when Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves, he says. But washing his hands in front of people, did that make him innocent? Did that make Pilate innocent? No, it didn't. He was still guilty. And how do we know that? Because every Lord's Day, and we did it today also, we recite the Apostles' Creed, right? And what does the Apostles' Creed say? He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. For 2,000 years, billions of Christians have been reciting this every Lord's Day, testifying that Pontius is still guilty, even though he washed his hands in water. So the clean hands and feet can be in a reflection, an outward sign of the pure heart that we may have. But just because you washed your hands and feet doesn't mean that your hearts are pure either. What we need to do is we need to clean our heart and our character, our faith, and our actions and motives. We need to make them pure. So how do we do that? Third point, we wash our hands and feet with water, but how do we wash our hearts, our motives, and our character? First of all, we do it with spiritual water. The water here symbolizes the cleansing and sanctifying power of God's word. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, it says, So that he might sa sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So outwardly we have water to wash, but inwardly it is the word of God that cleanses us. In John chapter 7, verses 37 through 38, Jesus said, When you believe in me, you will have a flow of living waters continually flowing up from within your heart. That is the living waters that we need to wash ourselves with. In the Bible, God commanded that the, lav the laver must always be filled with water. 20, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It must always have water in it. What does this mean for us? Well, this means that 
even though all of us who believe in Jesus Christ have experienced rebirth through the power of the blood of Christ, our hearts are still prone to be tainted by the sins of this world. Even though we believe in Jesus and he has atoned for our sins already, all of our sins are forgiven. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that we are perfect. We still stumble and fall. We still make mistakes. We still commit sins many times. So the water within the laver reminds us that we must continually cleanse and purify ourselves with God's word on a daily basis. In Psalm 119, verse 9, it says, How can a young man purify himself? It is through God's word. So those of us who have accepted Christ, just because Jesus has forgiven us, we can't say, oh, that's it, I'm done, I'm in heaven already, I'm saved, so I could do whatever I want, there are no consequences. It's not like that. All the more, because we have been cleansed through the blood of Christ, now we need to remind ourselves daily to wash our hearts with the word of God. Secondly, the water symbolizes the repentance of the saints. The laver was made of bronze. Now, where did they get this bronze from? It wasn't in our text today, but if you look in Exodus chapter 38, verse 8, it tells us where they got this bronze. In Exodus chapter 38, verse 8 says, Moreover, he made the laver of bronze with its base of bronze from the mirrors of the serving women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Did you guys know this? God made the laver out of the mirrors of the women who served in the tent of meeting. Today, when we think of mirrors, we think of glass, right? But in ancient times, they didn't have glass. So what do they do? They made mirrors out of bronze. They polished it real nicely so that it's shiny and you could reflect yourself and see yourself in it. So in ancient times, mirrors were made of bronze. And these women who served in the tent of meeting, these are women who served in the church, right? They voluntarily offered up their mirrors so that the labor of bronze could be made out of that. So you could imagine how shiny the labor must have been, right? Because it's made of mirrors. So not only did the priest wash at the laver, but they also checked themselves in the reflection of the bronze mirror. So this reminds us that we must daily check ourselves, examine ourselves in our spiritual mirror as well. The Bible reminds us that there are three types of mirrors that we need to see. First of all, we need to look in the mirror of our conscience. The conscience is something that God implanted in our hearts. It is always on God's side. It tells us what we did wrong. If you don't listen to your conscience, you're not looking at the mirror. Every morning we have to look at our mirror before we go out, right? We need to listen and look in the mirror of our conscience. And secondly, we need to look in the mirror of God's word. The word of God has been given as an example and a mirror for those of us living in the end times so that we will not make the same mistakes that the Israelites did several thousand years ago. And thirdly, we need to look in the mirror of the spirit of truth. When we accept Jesus Christ, God gives us the Holy Spirit in our hearts, the spirit of truth. And he will tell us what our status is, how we're doing, what we need to change. And all of this goes to show that daily repentance is needed even for Christians. The water in the laver symbolizes the repentance of the saints. In Mark chapter 1 verse 4, it says that John the Baptist gave a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 16, it says, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. So what God is saying is, 
the symbolic ceremonial washing of your hands and feet is actually reminding us that we need to get rid of the sin that is within us and in our lives. And we could only do that through repentance. And remember how Jesus washed the feet of his disciples at the Last Supper? After eating the Last Supper, Jesus put a towel around his waist. He knelt down. He took Peter's feet, Peter's smelly, dirty feet, and he was going to wash it. At first, what did Peter do? He said, no, 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 please don't do that. I have to wash your feet. You can't wash my feet. But then Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you have no part of me. And what was Peter's response? He said, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. He wanted Jesus to wash his whole body. And then Jesus said to him in verse 10, in John chapter 13, verse 10, Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. So here we see a relationship between bathing and washing. And this is something that we need to understand. Jesus said, he who has bathed, meaning his whole body has been bathed already, right? So you don't need to be bathed again, but you just need, you just need to wash your feet. And the reason for this is because in ancient times, they didn't have paved roads. They walked on dirt roads. And their shoes were sandals. So they were always, their feet were always exposed to the dirt on these streets. So whenever you went into the house, usually the custom was you had the slave come and wash your feet with water. But now Jesus was doing this. Jesus was acting like he's a slave washing the feet of his disciples. So what's the relationship between bathing and washing the feet? In Old Testament terms, the bathing here would symbolize the altar of burnt offering where you give a sacrifice, and through that, all of your sins are atoned for. In New Testament terms, the bathing would symbolize the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. That has completely washed all of us from all of our sins. But then the washing of the feet would correspond to the laver in Old Testament terms. You've already given a sacrifice at the altar, so your sins are forgiven. However, on a daily basis, we still need to repent. We still need to wash our hands and feet because they still get dirty. In New Testament terms, those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ and been washed or bathed in the blood of Christ still need to wash our hands and feet. And that corresponds to the repentance of, our, of the saints. Those of us who have, who have accepted Christ still need to repent on a daily basis. Because like I said at the beginning, we still sin, we still make mistakes, and we still stumble. So as Jesus reminded Peter, if you've been bathed already, you just need to wash your hands and feet. We don't need Jesus to die on the cross once again. He did that already. We've been bathed in his blood. But now what we need is daily washing through God's word and through repentance. Repentance cleanses us and it sanctifies our entire being. And repentance is a lifelong requirement for all Christians because we acknowledge that even though we have been born again through the blood of Christ, we are still weak and frail in the flesh. So those who don't repent are very prideful people because they are deceiving themselves. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10 says, If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So I pray that all of us, We'll be faithful in daily washing ourselves through God's word and through repentance. Amen? Thirdly, the water symbolizes our baptism. What is baptism? 
Baptism is a ritual where you go into the water, you come out. When you're going in, you're saying the old self is now dying with Christ. And when you're coming out of the water, it's saying that now you are a new being in Christ. That's what Romans chapter 6 verse 4 tells us. And in Titus chapter 3 verse 5, it talks about the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. The Bible talks of two types of baptisms. First is a baptism of water, and the second is a baptism by the Holy Spirit. So we need this two-step journey in our life of faith. First is a washing of regeneration. So when we are baptized, we are Christians, we have been washed of all of our sins, and we have been regenerated. We are new beings. But if we stop there, we are left clean but empty. And that's not good. Clean is good, but empty is not good, right? So we need the second path, which is a renewal and filling of the Holy Spirit. So for example, in Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45, it talks about this person where uh, he was possessed with an unclean spirit. But somehow the unclean spirit left the man. Maybe Jesus drove him out. And then it says, the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will also be with this evil generation. See, Jesus told us this parable about a man who had the unclean spirit driven out of him, so his heart was cleansed now, right? But he never filled it with anything else. So what happens? The evil spirit comes and finds it very clean, so he brings seven other spirits with him and goes into the man. So what this is teaching us is that once we are cleansed, now the second part of our duty is to fill ourselves. We need to fill ourselves with the Holy Spirit. We need to fill ourselves with God's word. In Acts chapter 10, verse 44, it says, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. So you see, these two things are actually the one and the same. When we hear the word of God, that is when the Holy Spirit comes to us. We first need to cleanse ourselves through the blood of Christ and through repentance. And then after that, we need to fulfill the task of filling ourselves with God's word and with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is the one who does both for us. He not only cleanses us with water, but he also fills us with his blood and with the Holy Spirit. That's why in 1 John chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, it says that Jesus is the one who came by water and blood, not with the water only, but with the water and with the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. See, John tells us that Jesus came with water and blood. And remember when he was hanging on the cross, the Roman soldier speared his side and what happened? Water and blood came out of his side. So Jesus brings us both, cleansing by water and new life in his blood. In Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, it tells us that the life of the flesh is in the blood. So through the blood of Jesus Christ, we receive Jesus' Holy Spirit and his eternal life. So he gave us both the water and the blood. My beloved saints, I pray that today through this message, May the labor in the tabernacle remind us daily that we need to wash ourselves through the word and repentance. And not only that, after we are cleansed, may we be faithful in filling our hearts with God's word so that we will be filled with the Holy Spirit so that none of the evil spirits of this world may come into any one of us. And I pray this blessing upon all of you in the name of the Lord.
In conclusion, I pray that we will be eternally cleansed through the power of the water and the blood of Christ. And by so doing, I pray that we will be able to go boldly to the throne of grace so that we may receive all of the blessings that God has in store for us. Amen? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this Lord's Day. We thank you for the united worship of Evergreen Church. As we have all come together as one, may you bless us as a family. May you become our one Father, and may Jesus become our one Lord. And I pray that we will all be united in one faith so that we could all receive the same blessings that you have promised to Abraham and his descendants. Father God, today as we have learned about the labor, may this serve as a reminder that even as Christians, even though through the blood of Christ we have been forgiven of all of our sins, we are reminded once again that daily repentance and washing ourselves through the word of God is needed. Help us to be faithful in this task so that no unwanted sins may remain in our hearts or in our lives. And may it never serve to be a separation between you and us, Lord, but I pray that through your word and through prayer, may we always come closer to you daily so that we may be able to walk with you on a daily basis. We thank you so much for this blessing, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give glory to God with our applause.